To see the fully uncut version of this video, head over to patreon.com forward slash John Joe Lyons. What's that like to live delicious? What's going on? My name is John Joe Lyons, and today I'm here to present to you my review for Voyage to Agatis. Written and directed by Marion Dora, who you might remember from a delightful little film that I reviewed called The Angel's Melancholia. I quite like it. I thought it was good. The majority of other people don't agree. And that's fine. It's okay. Voyage to Agatis stars... All of these lot. A wealthy couple lures a pr person to a seemingly innocent yachting cruise under the sun. However, by the end of the day, she will end up humi not having a very good time and, above all, not a fan of the experience. Sorry, but I'm getting this video monetized if it kills me. Am I even allowed to say that? Voyage to Agatis is a film that I've been looking forward to checking out for quite some time now, just simply because it looks to be one of Marion Dora's most accessible films to date. With the extremity of his other movies taking a backseat in favor of a more character-driven story, at least much more than the mind-bendingly depressing film that is The Angel's Melancholia. That's not to say that things don't get rowdy eventually. They most certainly do. But thankfully, that'll be much later down the line in this one. He says directly to the person manually reviewing his video. Hi, mate. How's it going? You c while Angels was at times painful to get through, I feel like it was successful in presenting us with exactly what the director was going for. So with this movie, I'm not only looking forward to seeing what the goal is, but also how artistically creative Dora's execution is. It's time to go on the holiday from hell. This is Voyage to Agatis. The movie begins with this woman having a lovely walk through town, looking around and taking in the sights. <clears throat> Cut to the same woman having a less good time running naked through the countryside. She gets to a beach, has a splosh around in the water, silently screaming when she's joined by this hand grabbing her by the hair. They struggle around and I really like the camera work and sound design here. Dora includes the waves and other sounds of the beach while removing the screams of the woman, giving it this almost dreamlike presentation. And if that isn't uncomfortable enough, it's all shot in extreme close-up and handheld, making the whole thing a frenzied affair, juxtaposed against the tranquility of the relaxing soundscape. Oh, very nice. Oh, very nice. We then cut between shots of water and the woman being given a joker smile. Want to know how I got these scars? I was in a Marion Dora film. Other cuts are shown and then we see a shot of the woman having a sleepy, sleepy lie down on the beach. A nice, calm, sleepy lie down. She seems so relaxed. We then hear this voiceover. The voiceover comments on the blood and women who dry up and collapse like dust as the victim is dragged to rocks decorated with various skulls. Cut to a baby doll with white eyes floating in filthy water and then to a couple driving down the motorway. This is Raphael and Isabel. They drive in silence as we see the landscape and Raphael takes a sip of whiskey. Isabel complains saying that if he continues to drink, she'll have to pilot them the whole way, but Raphael ignores her and continues. Still 220 kilometers away, she asks for some encouragement, but he just burps, which she says is disgusting. Isabel looks like she's about to cry, and they enter a tunnel as darkness envelops the fray. Cut to the couple at a bar when we see this bloke I f Isabel. Raph gets in his face, asking if he wants to buy her when this girl approaches, giving him a cigarette. Raph lights it and the girl kisses this bald breader before returning to the couple. Here Raph introduces her as Lisa, advising she got him out of trouble. He tells Lisa that this is Isabel who is complicated, but f***s good. That's weird. That's exactly how my grandmother used to introduce me to her friends. Raph asks Lisa if she wants to f*** 
good, then offers her a chance to feel the freedom. Isabel storms off and Raph says he usually believes what he says and then we settle on this shot of Lisa. I don't know about you, but I'm feeling pretty worried for Lisa right now. Worried and rock hard. <laughs> Cut to some shots of the town and then to the marina where various boats are moored. Cut to a POV walking through town and then this little meower. Cut to Lisa meeting the couple as they get ready to leave on their boat. She says she also does what she says and Raph tells her that her decision was the right one. <laughs> Spoiler alert, it wasn't. Isabel gets in a huff and we see the cat one last time before heading out to sea. We see shots of the shoreline, pass under a bridge and then see a shot of the boat from the local cemetery. Foreshadowing of things to come perhaps? Cut to Lisa throwing up over the edge of the boat with Raph holding her forehead. I don't know much about women but that's not how you do that. We see Lisa try to read with Raph putting a stop to that, Isabel looking out at the water and Lisa smoking with Raph while Isabel lies down to sunbathe. Cut to Lisa turning on a radio and joining Isabel while Raph captains the ship. He puts out his cigarette and we see a picture of a young girl. And I wonder who this could be. Is it Isabel when she was younger or perhaps the couple's daughter? Or better yet, a past victim. Not that there's anything to worry about with these two. I, I don't know why I said victim. Cut to Raph teaching Lisa how to drive the boat and then to Isabel rubbing her feet as Lisa drives. Cut to Raph rubbing lotion into Lisa's skin and just having the best time. He stops himself from touching her any more intimately and we cut to him being knocked away by Isabel. Doffy then throws Lisa's hat into the water. We get more shots of the water when Raph pulls Lisa's bikini down and offers her a drink. Back to more chilled music and shots of water. Stop showing me the f***ing water. They're on a boat in water. You've established that, mate. Cut to Isabel looking at tarot cards and then to Lisa as she sees something break the water's surface. She picks it up and sees that it's a doll in tattered clothes. Cut to Isabel throwing this card into the water and Lisa returning the doll to its watery grave. Lisa throws the devil card in and we watch it float away before cutting to another shot of water and then the sun setting. Cut to Raph finishing a cigarette and then heading below deck, then to Lisa going to the bathroom. We see Raph serve up dinner, calling for Lisa to join them. When she sits, the pair toast to freedom while Isabel sits watching, her glass empty. Lisa and Raph mercilessly flirt with Raph saying that he's glad Lisa is here. He offers her weed but she declines saying the wine is good enough. He calls her a good girl and then asks what she was doing in the bathroom. Can I ask you a question? What? You were on the toilet, right? Uh-huh. What did you do there? What did I do there? Why are you doing a sh**? Hmm? She is surprised, asking why he wants to know and Raph laughs, saying when Isabel is in the toilet it always stinks. He then asks Isabel why she isn't eating, dropping this bar. Nur wer gut isst, kann auch gut schaffen, ja? Iss. Raph tries to get Isabel to drink, but she pushes the glass back towards him. Lisa tries to defuse the situation, but Raph tells her when he wants her opinion, he'll ask for it. The couple continue to slide the glass, getting more violent with Raph eventually throwing it away. He then tries to force Isabel to eat, but Lisa gets involved. She tries to appeal to Isabel, but catches a slap to the face for her effort. <laughs> as Lisa cries in Raph's arms. Cut to morning and more music over shots of water. Isabel strips off to sunbathe naked as Lisa lies close by and Raph drives. Cut to Raph dropping anchor and telling Lisa it's her turn to drive. He also tells her he's decided from now on she won't wear anything on top. She puts on a t-shirt so Raph throws her watch overboard. She refuses to take the t-shirt off and then Isabel throws her shoes over. After threatening to do the same to her bag, Lisa relents and then gets thrown overboard herself by Raph. He then orders her to remove her bottoms before she's tied up and let back on the boat. Cut to some time later as Raph fishes something out of the water and we see Lisa tied down to the boat. Raph cuts open whatever the f*** this thing he got out of the water is. But as my dear old mum used to say, anything's a dildo if you're brave enough. God rest her soul. Raph pulls all the guts out of this f thing and then throws some onto Lisa's body. He then cuts the thing up into slices and eats it. Lisa says she's thirsty and so Raph spits wine and the sea creature bits into her face. He then assaults her with Isabel watching and playing a guitar solo. It's all very horrid. 
The couple then stand on the highest point of the boat, silhouetted by the sun in an almost angelic sight. Cut to Isabel listening to the radio as Raph runs his knife up and down Lisa's body. He tells her not to worry about Isabel as he has long finished with her, that she stands in his way, that he likes Lisa and if she is good she has all the possibilities. Isabel puts her head to her knees and we cut to yet another shot of the open water. Cut to the couple looking out at the water when Isabel asks what happened. She says how strange it is that everything is finding itself as we see the doll floating in the water once more. Cut to more water. We get it, man. We get it. We we get it. Water. I wonder how long this movie would be if I cut out all the water shots. Cut to nighttime as Isabel goes out to Lisa. Lisa begs Isabel to let her go, but she refuses, saying she cannot escape from here. It seems that she's one of Raph's victims as well, and while initially her issue looked to be one of jealousy, in fact, actually, it's more a hatred of Raph and knowing exactly what Lisa is destined to go through. She hands Lisa a top when she tells Isabel she needs to pee. Isabel tells her to let it flow, and she does. She then hands Lisa a knife and tells her it's for tomorrow and it will be her her only chance. Lisa asks what that means, but Isabel just tells her to remember her words. Cut to the doll underwater as Lisa spouts some poeticisms referring to Isabel and her place in this f***ed up family. Cut to the water. And then to the shore of an island and then the boat. The couple walk onto deck naked and Raph tells Lisa that she should have some fun. He asks Isabel if she wants more and then we cut to Raph raising the anchor and heading to the island. He picks up the picture of the mysterious girl and then drops the anchor again. Cut to Isabel untying Lisa while Raph with the anchor chain. He tells her she's free to go and the women share a look. Raph forces her off the boat and Lisa swims away as the couple get dressed. We see Raph slip a knife into his pocket, the pair share a look and then we cut to Lisa arriving at the shore with her knife. Cut to Raph and Isabel also arriving at the island with their knives and the tension starts to rise. Isabel tells Raph to let her go or chase after her if he fancies her. Cut to Lisa walking and then the pair share in a smoke when they spot her. We get this gorgeous shot of Lisa standing in the sun with her blade and then see the couple approaching her. They back her into a corner and Raph tells Lisa to do it. Isabel tells Raph to finish her. He screams now or never. She screams never and with that her decision is made and Raph acts stabbing her in the stomach. <laughs> follows is a savage knife attack where Lisa gets murdered all the way to death. Right the f*** to death. I'm not going to go into too much detail here, but she gets stabbed to f***ery in places that you really don't want to be stabbed. I mean, you probably don't want to be stabbed anywhere, but these are like high on the list of... If you if you had to be stabbed, you wouldn't want to be stabbed there. And that's where she gets stabbed. Tongues are cut, things are cut off, things are pulled out, and at one point, a whole pint of this yellow stuff erupts out of her. So yeah, not good. And the whole time, Isabel's watching with this blank expression on her face. We get a wide shot of the aftermath and then cut to a bird in the sky and the couple's faces. Raph hugs Isabel and the pair cry together. I don't know if they're crying, but I kind of like to imagine that they are. They like, overcome with emotion after this uh, this act. Cut to Raph dumping Lisa with the other skulls as we pull out to view the landscape. The boat pulls away, we see the water, the sun sets, and we get a closing speech from Lisa. <laughs> The end. Well, that was a lot more chilled out than I thought it was going to be. Voyage to Bogatis is a film that I found shocking, but not in the way that I expected coming from the director of The Angel's Melancholia. That film was an endurance test of misery in the guise of high art, and while I was aware that Voyage would never be able to replicate such a visceral experience, I really wasn't prepared for just how much restraint Dora shows here. The story is simple enough with a couple picking up a sex worker to take on their boat. They take the girl, degrade and eventually kill her before setting off home. We don't really get anything more than that. The opening shows us that brutal violence is on the menu and with the later actions of Raph we are to presume that the woman is an earlier victim. But the question is, how much earlier? We can see from the skulls the woman is dumped next to that she's not the first, so how long has he been doing this? Where's Isabel? Could this be before he met her and if so, how did he get her to play for the degrade and murder team? None of this is addressed in the slightest which is a little frustrating. Just a little clue would be great. For fun, this is my take. This film is about a couple of demons picking up an angel and offering it the freedom of choice, of defiance, of maybe having the ability to disagree with the Lord's word once in a while. They promise to take her to Agatis, a place on the edge where heaven and hell meet. There the angel can experience a sliver of hell, the freedom of choice demons have and so it agrees. On the way they try to turn the angel, encouraging sin and degradation. On arrival the angel is presented with the sliver of hell the demons promised and then ripped to pieces. The demons 
weep with joy having destroyed something so beautiful and then set off to find another. But that's just some bullshit made up having no other alternative, so, you know, whatever. Looking at the characters again, we don't really have much to dig into. We have the sadistic and shit out your own face insane Raph who we don't really learn much of anything about. He clearly harbours an underlying hatred for seemingly everyone and flips between playful joy and rage with ease. I would have liked to have been given a clue about his motives, past or literally anything about him, but as it stands, he's just a guy. You could read into the lack of characterization as Raph being a representation of the animal of man, but this might be just giving the piece too much credit. He's a rapey who plays with his food before devouring it in a fit of violence. Fine. Isabel is a character we don't really learn much of anything about. Again, my headcanon is that she's a previous victim. One that had many possibilities like Lisa, but managed to somehow not p Raff off. She does what she does to survive. When she tells Lisa with such certainty that she wouldn't be able to get away even if Isabel untied her, that screams previous experience of a situation such as this occurring in her past. When she let a victim go and they were caught. Also, we see a flash of enjoyment when Isabel touches Lisa and this suggests that she is getting some sort of pleasure out of Raph's work. Perhaps she is too far gone, having committed many atrocities with Raph and feels this is why she herself can never escape his grasp. I love the way that with this read, the treatment of Lisa by Isabel goes from being born of jealousy or worry of being replaced to becoming born of guilt or empathy with her knowledge of what's to come. Lisa is our sacrifice. The fallen angel scooped up by the demons. Out of all the actors, I feel like Lisa, played by Jana Lisa Dombrowski, has the most to do and delivers the best performance, even in the quieter moments. Hers is a character who is gentle and exudes hope in contrast to the dour Isabel and the barely contained rage of Raph. I feel like she's a ray of sunshine disrupting the shadows and this is why in the eyes of Raph she must be destroyed. We could see her being chipped away throughout the movie, first with the offer of weed, then the force disrobing, ultimately the ending in her rape and death. But what's important here is that even in the face of certain death, Lisa refuses to lower herself to their murderous ways. Raf tells her it's now or never, she screams never in defiance and then is gutted but dies without sin. Like a boss. Kind of. Technically, the film is the familiar low-budget art house fair with a documentary aesthetic that mirrors Dora's style in Angel's Melancholia. Personally, I love this style as it gives Dora's films a level of realism that mixed with the ultra-violence makes for an especially uncomfortable experience. The violence itself isn't quite as visually graphic, but that's more so due to the quick-cut editing during Lisa's death scene rather than a lack of blood or gore. We see flashes of what's going on but don't linger on any one shot. Admittedly, we're with that one shot for probably the longest, but I'd imagine that's because of how utterly overlined the action taking place is. But on the whole, compared to Angels and what I've heard of his earlier work, it seems the filmmaker made a choice with this film to dial back the gratuity, and while some could argue this leads to his most boring film, I would argue it gives it a certain contemplative sensibility. To a certain degree, at least. I will say, for a movie that runs less than 90 minutes, it sure does feel long. The vast majority of the film is dedicated to three characters milling about on a boat, and that's totally fine. Usually I love stories with a minimal cast and a single location where not much happens, as long as there are interesting and engaging characters. Keep me interested and I'm happy to sit and just listen to them talk, to let them reveal themselves to us gradually as the film progresses. That unfortunately is not the case here. This bunch are bordering on lifeless for the most part, with the Lisa character being the highlight as at least she's allowed to emote. We learn nothing about the characters above what we're presented and the dialogue is so vague in places that we have nothing to drive the story forward, other than the anticipation of the inevitable horrible fate that will befall one of our cast, and the repeated shots of water, f me. I'll allow a shot or two for context of time and place, but there were an excessive amount of water shots here and it got super tiresome. I've seen such a practice employed a few times now and it's always so glaringly obvious when shots are repeated to bulk out the film. Why not just release a one hour cut and do away with it all? You could say that the repeats are there to instill the feeling of calm and tranquility, but it had the opposite effect on me. It just wound me up, honestly. All in all, Voyage to Agatis is a fine film that will be enjoyed by those who approach it with patience. It's not the absolute trial of a film like Angel's Melancholia was, but also not without its own merit. I enjoyed the presentation and climax, but the first two acts really didn't do much for me at all. And I'm a fan of the director's niche ways. In the end, Voyage is a disappointment, if only in the loss of what it could have been. So that was my review of Voyage to Agatis. What do you lot think? 
There's definitely artistry in Dora's work, much more so than any other extreme filmmaker that I've seen. I reckon if I had to pick, he's probably my favourite. Let me know in the comments if you feel the same, and if you don't, what filmmaker you'd put to the top of the deck. If you want to see this video completely uncut, especially what happens to Lisa at the end, go over to patreon.com forward slash John Joe Lyons. There's other stuff there like my Scream 5 pitch, updates on the channel, and shorter reviews coming soon. It's a whole bunch of stuff and it can all be yours for as little as a dollar a month. There's also a tier available where you can get an associate producer his credit on my next short but yeah get in that tier and you can be in the credits and for the first time let's give a shout out to the patrons that are already locked in much love to Richard McGowan III, Angel, Andrew Michael Berkmeyer, Jonathan Grandel, Samantha Cranmer, Emmanuel Conjo, Johnny Silver, Spooky, Ash Euro, Jamie Davis, President D4C, Scholastic Witch, Cedric Ramirez, Absence of God, Flasker, Colby Heimbetcher, Megan Gitz, Jonah Wilson, Later Mean Boy, Karen Botto, Taylor Stone King, Owen Morgan, Space Kibbins, and Lexi Anthony. You lot are the f best and a special shout out to pinky my oldest supporter and just an all-round great human i well appreciate it mate you're a legend got a really really nasty double feature coming next time there is no way that video is going to be monetized i've accepted it already it ain't happening so look forward to that but in the meantime thank you all for watching like share subscribe my name's john joe lyons cut to water